forget to like and subscribe. Ladies and gentlemen, get ready to be swept away on a whirlwind of talent and heart as we welcome an extraordinary individual whose life story reads like an adventure novel filled with passion, resilience, and boundless creativity. From the vibrant streets of Lancashire to the bustling artistic hub of Vancouver, his life has been a tapestry woven with threads of courage and passion. Imagine growing up in two worlds, mastering the art of sports at the highest level, while simultaneously nurturing a family of four and championing important causes and disability. He's a superhero both on and off the screen. But wait, it doesn't stop there. Picture this, a multi-talented artist who effortlessly transitions between acting, music, bringing characters to life on screen, while rocking stages with bands like Mr. M and the All-Nighters, and the soul-filled Van City Soul Quartet. You heard that right, his journey isn't just about acting alongside legends like Dick Van Dyke, or gracing blockbusters like Godzilla and Mortal Kombat. It's also about filling the air with melodies and rhythms to speak to the soul. He's not just a performer. He's a force of positivity and change. Through his writing, political endeavors, and creation of platforms like amputeeonline.com, he's a beacon of hope and empowerment for many. His dedication to shedding light on disability issues and advocating for change is inspiring. So get ready to be moved, entertained, and inspired as we dive into the world of this remarkable artist with a heart as big as his talent and a story that'll make your spirit soar. Please join me in welcoming the amazing and very talented Ian Gregson. Sir, thank you so much for your time and welcome to the show. Well, thanks, Chris. Thanks for inviting me. Not a problem. I, I want to dive into this with you, sir. You know, your journey seems like a whirlwind of an adventure from sports to music to acting and everything in between. So walk me through, how did you get involved with sports? What was that initial passion that got you there? Well, uh, initially, uh, I mean, I just started in uh, where I lived back in England. Um, you know, friends were, uh, I, initially I was, uh, in, before I lost my, I lost my leg when I was 15. So I'm an above knee amputee. Uh, I was a, had an accident when I was 15, and uh, so I. But I was involved in my my local track club before that, and I was pretty good at most of the events. I tried just about everything, and but running was my passion. Um, like a week before I I lost my leg, I uh, I was school cross country champion. So, you know, yeah, from 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 you know able to outrun uh, kids two or three years older than me, which was a big deal uh, back then. Um, you know, I, I became all of a sudden a person with a disability and at, at, at quite a young age. But I was encouraged to stay involved in sport by some pretty uh, heavy hitters in athletics. Uh, it might not mean anything to anyone, but Brendan Foster, Mary Peters, uh, all Olympic medalists, uh, in the day, uh, Munich 72, I think, uh, all sent me letters, because uh, they sent letters back then, uh, to, uh, to stay involved and uh, cited some other uh, fellas that I would later meet uh, at uh, the Paralympic events. And uh, yeah, and I, I, so I just stayed involved. Uh, just, just you know, because it was, it was always the thing, the passion for me, and I've always had a passion for competing in sports, and also for music, and that's always been the two big, uh, you know, loves of my life. Um, and then so, uh, yeah, I went from there. I just stayed involved, and I emigrated to Canada from Lancashire. Uh, I'll get your pronunciation right on that one. Uh, uh, in 81, 1981, as my dad famously says, uh, to get away from Maggie Thatcher. So, and when you were competing at such a high level in, in the Paralympics, there, what made you decide to to hang up the proverbial sports jersey? Uh, well, family mainly. Uh, my first wife at the time uh, didn't like me going away so much. And it was a lot. I mean, there was a lot of opportunity back in the day in the 80s. Uh, it was all paid for. I mean, it wasn't quite at the high level we are now with cardiac athletes and that kind of thing. That came after I retired. 
Uh, but um, yeah, most of the 80s, I was out and about uh, traveling from either across Canada, uh, internationally, I got me, myself in places like Australia, Korea, uh, lots of Europe, uh, Sweden, uh, Holland, uh, you know, just, just getting out and about. And uh, I was very fortunate at that time that, uh, um, you know, I could do that. Uh, but when you start settling down and having kids, uh, you know, priorities change. And uh, that started happening just kind of 1990 was my my last, uh, it was the World Championships in Holland. And I went to that. And then... Uh, yeah, I was. I would have been. It would have been great to go to Barcelona in '92 uh, for the Paralympics there. Uh, but I, what I did see in in the two Paralympics that I did compete at was a big difference between what happened in '84, which was a, an event that was separate from the Olympics, hmm. um, to '88, where it transitioned into using it all the same facilities in 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 Seoul and that was a big transition a big difference in the, between those four years and I'm glad I witnessed that and uh, and subsequently that's been how it's been run since uh, for good and sometimes not so good so so it was all in the betterment that between 84 and 88 when they did this merger that it actually turned out to be the better the, the better ultimate goal for everybody uh, facilities wise, I, I think definitely, I mean, I mean, why, why, you know, duplicate these things? Um, and, you know, it was the first time in a big Olympic stadium. I mean, I was in, I went into the stadium in, in Seoul, Korea. It was compared to kind of more of a, a regular track meet, uh, that was at the international games in New York in 84, which was, it wasn't officially called the Paralympics at that point. Um, it was it was night and day. It was like we go into a real. You felt that Olympic spirit, yeah. And uh, and subsequently, you know, the, the I think pretty well. I, I did go to the Atlanta Paralympics in '96 as a spectator and uh, uh, as media. And uh, yeah, it was the same. It was the same vibe. It was like so. I know you know they've moved on and, uh, and uh, yeah. It, it, it was a, a good thing to witness at the time. So you, you guys uh, immigrated over in the, the 80s, getting away from Maggie Thatcher, as you had so put it with your father. And then you kind of started this wonderful journey when we were looking at the Mr. M and the, and the all-nighters and then soulful Van City Soul Quartet. Right. How did you come up with these? Like, what was that passion? Well, yeah, that that came from as I mentioned earlier. I, I'm always always been involved in music. I, I, as you can see, I have a, still have a vinyl collection behind me, and uh, so I just always uh, I, I I started hanging out with a bunch of friends who weren't athletic, uh, but loved music, and so they all played guitars and bass and drums. So basically, even though I at the time didn't really play an instrument. Uh, I was the fifth guy in the band kind of thing. So I did sound, I gave my opinions, blah, blah, blah. I just hung out with them. And uh, that band turned into uh, what we call in England, a working men's clubs uh, band. So it, we, we it a cover band. We play local, you know, uh, uh, conservative clubs, labor clubs, social clubs, that kind of thing. Um, and so that was before I came to Canada. So basically the last two years before I came to Canada, we were driving around in the back of a Ford Transit van all over the north of England, you know, uh, five 18-year-old, 19-year-old guys. I mean, you, you can't beat that. So, uh, you know, uh, I would never do that now, but it, <laughs> uh, it, it was an experience. And it, it gave me, uh, I did sound. Uh, I've always done sound. Uh, as, as a sound tech and uh, for bands and uh, so I was happy with that loading gear and all that kind of stuff and a few other experiences with professional bands that I really enjoyed I came to Canada in 81 and it was it was a whole different thing uh, you know you, you you try to find your feet you find even you've come to a city that you don't know uh, you, you, the first real experience I had uh, was with Rod Stewart, of all people, 
And uh, he was playing at the Coliseum here in Vancouver. And I thought, well, I'm not. I'm having a hard time contacting people and getting up with bands. I did try going up with one band. It just didn't feel right. Mm. Um, so I went to Rod Stewart. And uh, I, I didn't realize at the time that all those big venues are all union. And I just didn't get the concept of that, you know, and they basically threw me out. And I, <laughs> I just said... You know, we don't want you here. Uh, you, you can't do anything. You, you're not in the union. And so I was kind of puzzled. So anyway, I, I ended up being involved with uh, the radio station, the student radio station up at SFU. And uh, I was involved in that for over like eight years. So I, at that time, I wasn't really, I was still, I've been playing guitar since I was 15. But it was only on, uh, in 2000 that I actually said, well, you know, I've been playing this thing for years. Mm -hmm. I got to do something with it. Either sell it or do something. And uh, a few years later, I got involved with a local uh, street band called the Carnival Band. And I played guitar with them uh, for about two years and kind of did a, a, a musical apprenticeship. And that's how Mr. M and the All Nighters started. And uh, because they had a lot, a street band has a lot of horn sections. So, uh, so I was able to have a full horn section, uh, uh, guitar, bass, drums, uh, and a female singer. But I needed something that was different than the regular tribute bands. And I, I looked at myself and I thought, well, what do I have? What do I know? And uh, in, in 2002, I'd gone back to England for a school reunion. And I met up with a fella that uh, we hired a DJ for the reunion. And his, his name was Russ Winstonley. And Russ Winstonley is the guy who basically started Wigan Casino. Now, for people who are, are, are not hearing this, Wigan Casino was a big scene uh, from about it's just celebrating their 50th anniversary, actually. Yeah. From from seventy three onwards, uh, it was an old Victorian music hall essentially. And but what Russ started was this appreciation of rare and kind of unheard of soul, uh, up tempo soul. And so it was basically his taste in in the music. Yeah, he, he had a music store in uh, Wigan, my hometown. And uh, so he had access to a lot of American imports, et cetera, et cetera. So the rarer the, the, the song, uh, the more popular it will be with this in crowd at Wigan Casino. And, uh, and so I, a good example is the original version of Tainted Love. Uh, people know the, the 80s version, but the original version was done by uh, Gloria Jones. I was only 15 at the time. That was 1966. Strangely enough, uh, Bruce Springsteen just covered a very rare Northern Soul tune called Do I Love You by Frank Wilson. So it's still out there. And so I came back and I thought, well, what? how, how am I going to do this musically for me? And that's what I wanted to do, a tribute band to this Northern Soul. Uh, and that's where the name Mr. M and the All Nighters comes from. So Mr. M was the manager and it was the, a side room of the Wigan Casino. The all-nighters as a, uh, what they call the event, it was uh, the Wigan Casino all-nighters. Mm -hmm. And that basically started about uh, 11, uh, 12 midnight and went till 8 a.m. Uh, and, uh, and so that's the Mr. M and the all-nighters. So, and essentially we were a, a Northern Soul tribute band uh, and we started that in, uh, I started that in 2007 or so. So, yeah, and, and it's just a final, final realization that music was, 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 you know, playing guitar and running a band, uh, you know, it was something I'd like to do. It, it's this wonderful, diverse career that you have from sports to, to music and even working on iconic shows like Murder, She Wrote to dubbing for Aaron Pearl and Wrongfully Accused. How did you get involved in acting if you were, it, it, you know, we went from sports, we've, we've gone into your music. So how what was this passion, this drive to switch into the world of acting? Uh, well, I, how, how did I, I, I think what happened, I, because I was involved in sports, uh, and even though I was not competing internationally, I was still kind of competing in, in, in powerlifting locally. So I just said, you know, I would go locally 
uh, and so uh, the, I, I think through one of the my prosthetic shop uh, where we get my prosthetic leg referred and whatnot, um, they were looking. Some show was looking for amputees for a hospital scene at uh, Eagle Ridge Hospital here in uh, in, in uh, Port Moody. And uh, so I went and uh, I mean, I didn't know anything about the film industry. I just went and uh, Dick Van Dyke was was the lead and it was a murder she wrote. And it was just basically me in a wheelchair going up and down the corridor. And I got the bug. Um, and I just I mean, I don't really have a lot of acting experience. I don't. But I just I, I, I thought it was just a natural kind of um, sideline to to music, uh, to sports uh connected in my head and i've been working in the film industry on and off pretty well since 92 which was when i got started there and uh yeah i just just went on from this but most of the 90s just doing kind of maybe uh ipt roles uh similar not very not working a lot um but basically uh, you know, I, I, if there was an MPT person on set that they needed, I would be that person. And then uh, through through um, like most of the 2000s, up until 2008, for about 10 years, I worked at Simon Fraser University, which I, where I graduated from. And then uh, that ended uh, in its own uh, its own way. <laughs> and then I, I, I naturally got back into doing uh, background work and uh, that progressed and I ended up getting, luckily, thankfully, a full union uh, because of being an amputee. And this is where I always think it's kind of interesting is because many people see the, the you know, a person with a disability or a person who's lost a leg as a, a, you know, a, a, a limitation. Mm -hmm. I've never seen it that way. I, and especially in the film industry, it's given me opportunities to kind of say, okay, well, I don't think there's anybody around doing this. So I found my kind of niche in, in the film industry. Uh, I got hired as, I, I mean, I've done, I, I'm not an actor per se, but I, I've done acting roles. And so how it works in the film industry, if you get an acting role, you get a credit, what they call a credit. And that adds on to being a full member in the union. And I got full union within about uh, four years of starting back uh, from in 2000 and when I finished at SFU. So some people wait 20 years for that and, and they're still waiting. So I, I consider myself very lucky and uh, I make the most of something that I don't have. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so, yeah, I'm a, a full union member. Uh, my credits were basically for uh, I played an amputee ghost on uh, with a few lines on uh, uh, a kids TV show here and uh, and then I did I, I've done I'd stunt doubles my my third credit ended up being a a stunt on uh, the TV show When Calls the Heart um, yeah it's 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 the, the industry uh, uh, up until this year has been very reward, rewarding. Uh, with the strikes going on right now, it's been very tough. Uh, for, I think like six days of work this year. So it's, it's the industry hasn't seen anything like this. So it's currently, it's, it's hopefully going to pick up. Uh, and, because, and, and that's because the Americans come to, uh, spe especially Vancouver, but also Toronto. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we depend on them for so much of our work. And uh, without them, we're, 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 we're floundering and we continue to flounder here in Vancouver. So. It, it is odd that the the strike down that way, I mean, you know, the strike is a good thing for all the union that's out there where it did impact Canada and the industry to a degree that we've never really seen before. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, you're absolutely right. We rely heavily on the Americans bringing up work into Canada for everyone. Uh, so it, it is pretty neat. But I mean... You've worked on these various projects, you know, blockbusters like Godzilla and Mortal Kombat. What would you say has been your most challenging role to date? Uh, well, there's sometimes there's some very physical uh, roles uh, to do. 
Uh, I remember one, I forgot what it was. I think it was a battle scene of some kind. And it was in the middle of winter. And they wanted me, uh, as you know, Vancouver gets very wet. I think it was like March. And it was free. It was like on that border between freezing and pouring. Uh, it's one or the other. And uh, we're out in the mud. It was a night shoot. It was raining. And I was on crutches. And the crutches were sinking deep into the, like six inches into the mud. And it was very tiring. And uh, I remember doing, it was like a, a post battle scene of some kind. So they wanted a person with, with you know, missing a leg, but somehow was it still able to use crutches? I don't know. <laughs> uh, and, and then we were, it was just like down a path, they were shooting this. And then there was a bench. I thought, okay, I'll just get to this bench. And I'll just, you know, your arms are tired. And I'm just about to sit on the bench and the director sat on it. He just looked at me. It's like, fine, you sit there. I will carry on. That that kind of thing, you know? You just shake your head. You do want to say, you know, something, but you shouldn't. But you keep it to yourself, you know? Those are kind of things. Some Sometimes... I have to say, overall, uh, there's two, le uh, when it comes to uh, the movie work, I go as a regular background person. I, uh, most of my work, my, my, my uh, you know, most of my work is just regular background. Uh, most of the per people I work with don't even know I'm, a, I'm an IPT. Uh, uh, so, but when I get called for a uh, specific NPT work, that's what they call special skills. So, you know, most people can't do that properly. So there's, there's all kinds of different levels in, in movie work and special skills is, is something that uh, I was on the TV show Snowpiercer in the first season. Uh, and for the whole season, uh, it was special skills. They hired about, I don't know, 10 to 15 people with different disabilities uh as as a part of the train crew if you haven't anybody seen snowpiercer and uh and it was amazing uh it was it was great work for that whole you know four months and we were uh, and then we got budget cuts and then we all got chopped so for the second season we didn't even you know nothing and and you know you don't guarantee any kind of screen time and we were on that for Four months. I think I got about two seconds of screen time the whole season. So, you know, it's a it's a funny old business, right? Uh, but I love it, and uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm quite involved with my union as well. So, now, yeah. outside of the this the sports, the music, the acting, what else do you do that contributes to your personal and creative growth? Uh, isn't that enough? <laughs> <laughs> I don't really have time for much else. Uh, well, uh, there's a couple of things I do. Um, I don't know if you can see it right now. Uh, no, it's um, I like I like to spend a lot of time in virtual worlds. Uh, I do some. Uh, some people might know what uh, Second Life. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, there's something called Open Sim. Uh, um, I have an avatar. Uh, I DJ there. I, I ha host some land in there. Uh, and I play. I, I, I stream the music uh, off my computer, which I'm talking on right now. And, um, you know, I basically uh, play to my backing tracks that I've recorded uh, in Logic on my computer here. And just you know, drop out the guitar and the vocals, and I sing right here in my house, and I get paid for it. So uh, I actually get paid more than playing live here in Vancouver. So, so, and that's the other thing too is with the movie industry kind of tanking right now. That I have actually started up Mr. M and the All Nighters after we were we've been out of it for about 2015. I found that what happened was I'm so busy in the movie industry. Uh, scheduling gigs and rehearsing and the unpredictability of 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 the movie industry i mean i could get a call now and work tonight 
that would be nice. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's it didn't they didn't mess at, and at a certain point it was really not working out, and so um, you know the money is in the movie industry, uh, or it was up until this year. Uh, and there's a lot of musicians, it turns out, actually work in the movie industry here in Vancouver. And uh, so there's not, um, relatively speaking, there's not a lot of money in the Vancouver music scene for where I'm at with, even with tribute bands and whatnot. Uh, and being full union in, in, in the movie industry, it's, you know, there's a fairly consistent income there. Uh, but with the strike, I've just started up the band again. We just played a gig on Thursday, uh, just our second gig with, uh, but this time it's going to be all original material uh, that mm. I've been working on for the last 10 years, basically. Wow. And so that's taken me on a different track. It's not a tribute. I'm still using the name, um, um, but I think um, going out with original material is very different. It's much more personal. And uh, it's very different than doing other people's music. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, with music, uh, you know, uh, working in the film industry. And basically, I hang out as an avatar on my on, on my PC. And, and, and that's about it. Uh, a lot of people say I spend too much time on Facebook. And that's another addiction that I have. So mm. I think that better covers it. <laughs> And Ian, as we're talking about these personal connections, what's something that you believe people tend to misunderstand about you the most? Uh, a, a, a few things. Um, a lot of people think I'm I'm a grumpy old man. <laughs> I don't know why. Do I look like one? I don't know. Maybe I do. Maybe I sound like one. Um, no, it does, it, it's hard to say. Um, I, I I think um, just from my, you know, I've been living in Canada 40 years and I still find people seeing me as a foreigner. Hmm. Um, they hear the accent and they're interested. Uh, but I know I've lived I, I, with some expertise. I can say Vancouver is not the most friendliest place in the world. Uh, and, you know, I, I've been here long enough. I think I qualify to say that. That's and I find a lot of people who agree. Um, the people who are born and raised here uh, don't quite get it. Um, but I find that um, making friends has been tough in this. I mean, I still talk to friends that are back in England. I'm very well connected with the people back in England, even though I've not lived there for 40 years. I've been back quite a few times. Mm -hmm. I was back last in 20, 2018. But, uh, yeah, it's been tough. And it's always been on that. I don't know. I think people just have this kind of impression of me of, of something that I'm not. And uh, and that's, that's the challenging because, you know, I, I think I'm a fairly friendly person. So, yeah. And, and sir, I have time for one last question for you today, and I really appreciate your time. What's uh, what makes Ian Gregson smile? Uh, a couple of things. Um, there's when the if I keep it in the music sense, I can be on stage, and uh, something happens on the stage playing in the band that I like. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a symbiotic relationship between band members on stage. And when things go well, and there's a, a, some magic happens on stage, that makes me smile. Uh, it's, it doesn't happen a lot, uh, but it can happen between, uh, in this case, there's four of us right now. Uh, but there's been a few instances over, over the years where something happens on, it's hard to put your finger on what it is, but it's like a, a, a connection between the band members and I feel it and that makes me smile. Very well said. And sir, as I said, that was the, the last question I had for you today. Thank you so much for joining me today. Everyone out there, the amazing Ian Gregson, make sure you Google him when you get the opportunity. Remember to smile to inspire and have a fantastic day. Thank you, everybody.